Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about body composition and body image. Um, we'd like to focus on performance, nutrition for performance, uh, and try to get away from ideas about body shape and body image. Um, these are traps uh, that you'll see a lot of people make in social media um, where people are focused on one particular body shape. Um, where indeed, in fact, uh, top athletes have a diverse uh, body shapes and body sizes. Uh, and, and you should uh, be worried more about um, uh, performance than, uh, than anything else. So, first of all, let's dispel some common myths. Um, th the first myth is this. Um, many people believe that lighter is faster and lighter is better. And this simply is not true. Uh, in fact, your body will naturally find its best functional weight as long as you provide it with the fuels that it needs, the nutrition that it needs. Now, as long as you're fueling correctly, uh, your body will naturally fall into its best possible shape. Uh, I'd like to point out this um, athlete here, Christian Blumenfeld. He is the world's best triathlete, um, frankly. Uh, he won the Olympic Games. Uh, he's won uh, 70.3 Ironman World Championships. Uh, and he placed uh, third at the Ironman World Championships uh, last year. Uh, he is an incredible triathlete, yet because of his body shape and his body size, people fat shame him, regardless of the fact that he is in fact probably the best triathlete in the world currently. So please don't listen to others, um, and if a uh, uh, a coach or another fellow athlete is shaming you, you should report them. That's uh, abusive behavior. So let's talk about the physical makeup of an athlete. Um, one of the simplest models for body composition, and this is the one that we're going to use mostly in this course, is the two-compartment model. In the two-compartment model, we're thinking of uh, two different separate parts of the, the, the body. We're talking about fat mass here, Typically, that's in the 15 to 25% range, although some athletes will drop as low as 10%, male athletes, uh, body fat. Uh, and then fat-free mass. Uh, 75 to 85% of uh, your body is going to be fat-free mass. Okay. Fat-free mass includes the internal organs, it includes all the skeletal muscle, bone, and also, of course, all of your body, well, most of your body water. So... Most of the, many uh, nutrition courses will talk about something called body mass index. And body mass index is used as an indicator of disease um, sometimes, uh, particularly obesity. Um, and you might see a chart like this where a person can look up their height in inches uh, and their body weight coming across and then find, uh, find a number, which is their body mass index, okay? So, for example, uh, I'm around 70 inches tall, and um, I weigh 160 pounds. So if I come up here, you can see that my body mass index is around 23. That's in the uh, quote, unquote, normal range. Um, this body mass index calculation is unfortunately not very useful for athletes. Um, that's because athletes carry a lot of muscle. And muscle is very, very heavy. And because muscle is heavier than fat, body mass index is a very poor indicator of health for, uh, for athletes. In fact, many athletes will be in the ov overweight category, which nonetheless is a healthy ca category, um, or even in the obese category if they're holding uh, really heavy amounts of muscle because they're in uh, explosive um, sports requiring uh, uh, short-term anaerobic energy um, and power um, over short periods of time. Um, athletes with really high muscle, containing really high muscle, can be in this obese category. Um, nevertheless, their body fat percentages will be very low, and in fact, they're very, very healthy. So, body mass index, not very useful for athletes. Please steer away from that. Okay. Uh, when people talk about body mass index, uh, these are the categories that you'll see. You'll see that when uh, people have a body mass index under 18.5, that is considered underweight. Uh, this is the one category for body mass index that, as an athlete, you should pay attention to. If your body mass index drops below 18.5 or underweight, uh, you should see a nutrition professional and a doctor 
to be sure that there's not some underlying cause for you being underweight. Uh, most athletes, because they hold uh, high levels of muscle, will find that they naturally fall in the normal to overweight category. And some athletes, particularly power athletes, will find that they're in uh, uh, the early obesity um, categories. Um, they're not suffering from obesity. Um, they are just heavily muscled uh, and should ignore uh, this classification. Um, so athletes should be in the normal to overweight category. If you're in the underweight category, seek help. So let's have a look at some problems with body mass index measurements. Um, for example, let's take uh, this lean bodybuilder here, 1.8 meters tall, uh, weighing 100 kilograms. This is the sedentary individual here, also 1.8 meters tall um, and weighing 100 kilograms. You can see that this athlete here holding a lot of muscle mass uh, is far in a far healthier condition than this sedentary person here uh, with, a, with the same body mass index. Um, so you can see the body mass index is um, not very useful for our athlete. Uh, however, body mass index is quite useful for diagnosing uh, conditions that could lead to disease uh, such as uh, obesity and cardiovascular disease for these sedentary individuals. And that's why doctors use body mass index. Um, but again, it's not useful for uh, most athletes. So how are we going to um, measure an athlete's body composition? Now there are a number of ways of measuring body composition. Uh, in the two compartment model, we'd like to understand what's the fat mass and the fat-free mass. So how are we going to measure um, fat mass? Now there are many ways to do that and I'm going to talk from uh, the most accurate, uh, talk you through from the most accurate methods to the least accurate methods. Um, some of this is going to do with uh, accessibility as well. So first of all, most ac uh, the most accurate method for measuring body composition would be a DEXA scan. This would be a low energy x-ray scan, which scans your body um, looking for uh, different densities and can distinguish between fats and bone and muscle uh, and can give you a really detailed description of your body composition. Um, however, it is hard to find places that do DEXA scans uh, and, and get that measurement done. The next most accurate would be a BOD pod, which is um, air displacement. Uh, a medical professional would place you in a body pod um, and um, they would uh, look at how much air you displace in that pod. Um, this is moderately accurate, um, has moderate reproducibility and is uh, pretty easy to use. The next most uh, the next method is uh, bioimpedance scales, and you may see scales like this. You stand on these scales that run a small electric current uh, through your legs and through your arms, uh, and they use the uh, impedance of your body to understand how much uh, fat is present in your body. Now, this measurement is uh, of lower accuracy than the BOD pod and the DEXA scan. Nevertheless, it is pretty useful and it's an excellent starting place. Um, it suffers from problems with reproducibility. Um, you really need to measure at the same time of day and you need to be careful with your um, hydration before you um, do bioimpedance measurements to make sure that you're well hydrated every time uh, you do a body fat assessment using a bioimpedance scale. Last but by no means least, uh, calipers, um, uh, trained professionals um, can measure um, fat at different locations around your body using calipers. It's um, moderately accurate, um, relatively reproducible, uh, but very time consuming um, method for assessing um, body fat. So when measuring body composition, what are we going to do? Now, the most likely thing is you're going to have access to a bioimpedance scale. So uh, when you're measuring your body composition, you want to do a few things. First of all, you'd, you'd like to um, measure your body composition at one time of day, preferably in the morning when you wake up, preferably before breakfast, before you've got food in your stomach, um, and make sure that you are well hydrated to get that uh, measurement as accurate as possible. Absolutely, that you should be doing that measurement at the same time each day when you're doing your measurements. Um, if the 
uh, if there is a technician who is doing either the DEXA scan or the, or the work with the calipers, you should um, make sure that it's the same person every day, um, or you should use the same equipment. So if you're measuring using bioimpedance, you should always use the same bioimpedance scale and not change from one scale to the other because there's small differences between the calibration states of each piece of equipment. Now when you do all of these things, you'll get a number that may not be um, an accurate number, but it is a number that you can look at to follow the trends um, over months. And my suggestion would be that you measure body composition no more than once a month. And frankly, uh, once or twice a year would be more than enough for most athletes to measure body composition.